And I'd like to welcome you to my segment of the iVideo Tunes. Um, I'm 52 years old. I've been playing guitar since I was 12. So 40 years, if the math is correct. Um, I have to say that I absolutely love playing the guitar. I've played pretty much my whole career in one band in uh, Rush. We formed the band in 1968 on September 18th. So I had just turned 15 uh, and... And I can't believe that I've been in the same place. Well, I've been in many places, but in the same band uh, all this time. It's been an incredible journey for me um, as a musician and as a person. Everything in my life has been centered around the band. Everything is connected to what the band does. I, I don't think back on the summer of this year or that year. I think back on the tour of this year or that year. And, and that's how I reference pretty much everything in my life. And I think you'd probably find that Getty and, and Neil would agree that they, uh, they have those same kind of references. I think uh, this is a really great opportunity for me to show you some stuff that I do and the way that I play. It's always been fascinating to me to read in some of these music books, tablature books, how um, my parts have been uh, worked out. And, and generally, they're, they're, they're fairly accurate, but uh, I, I do have a tendency to play things a little bit differently that um, that uh, doesn't always translate well in those things. I, I, and I've also looked at some of them and thought, hey, you know what, maybe I should play it like that. That makes a little more sense. I don't read music that well. I studied classical guitar when I was 18 for about a year and a half and I enjoyed it very, very much. But at that point in the band's career, we started to work a lot. My music, uh, my guitar, classical guitar teacher, Elliot Goldner, uh, who was a very good friend from school um, and an excellent teacher himself. Uh, it was in a motorcycle accident. And so, you know, everything kind of worked out so that I, I couldn't continue with. So I sort of stopped there and maintained playing and practicing. And every once in a while, I pick up a piece and learn it. But uh, over the years, it just kind of drifted. I still try to play, um, but I don't quite as much anymore in the classical area. But... Um, I think it's important to really be diversified and learn all sorts of things. I'm playing a lot of acoustic guitar lately, really, really enjoying that, playing around with alternate tunings, and, and it's a wonderful way to find new expression, um, picking up an instrument, and maybe this is the way it is for a lot of you, but picking up an instrument and having absolutely no idea what you're doing with it. And that's the great thing about some of these um, alternate tunings. You, you tune it and... Of course, all these chords that you all learn don't mean a thing. And, uh, and it's very challenging and keeps you on your toes. Um, so I guess really what I'm saying is you can play guitar forever and ever and ever and, and, f and, f and forever. Love it and enjoy it. It's a wonderful, wonderful instrument to express yourself on. I have many friends who were in bands when they were teenagers or uh, in their youth and went on to have um, more normal lifestyles and to this day they still get together and play on the odd weekend with some buddies and um, and that's a wonderful wonderful thing to see and perhaps that's what you know you're like you're uh, looking to learn how to play some of these songs that you grew up with because you love playing the guitar and that's a great thing and I hope you get a chance to learn something from me today I started playing guitar when I was 12 years old, but I had an interest in it a long time. I, I think I became much more serious about listening to music when I was about 10. Um, I think by the time I was 12, I was pretty sure that music was where I wanted to spend the rest of my life, um, which I guess is kind of unusual. You, you kind of don't make those career decisions at such a young age. But there was something particularly about the guitar that just really captured my heart. And uh, uh, and, and I love to listen to classical music, um, classical guitar music. Um, my brother-in-law played guitar. He played a little bit of uh, um, flamenco, and I, I borrowed his guitar from time to time. My parents bought me my first guitar for Christmas uh, the year that I was 12 years old, and it was a Kent made in Japan. And, of course, it's, these aren't around anymore. 
but I think it cost about $25 and it was a, uh, an acoustic guitar with uh, kind of like a classical guitar but with steel strings on it. The strings were located somewhere within four or five inches of, above the neck and it was very, very difficult to play. But it was actually a good way to start. And of course, I learned those first few chords, you know, that, that E chord, that A chord, and that the D chord. And much of the popular music at the time comprised of those chords. Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones and countless others. I thought Fade Away. Um, a lot of my influences were influences that I guess my generation uh, all connected to. Hendrix was huge. And when Hendrix came along, I mean, I like to listen to that first wave of uh, English music, The Searchers, Dave Clark Five, a little bit of The Beatles. I wasn't a huge Beatle, Beatles fan. I was more of a Stones fan then. But then The Who came along, and I just really loved what I heard. Pete Townsend's playing was great, Roger Daltrey's and Keith Moon. I mean, they were such a great band with such great songs. And they were so uh, more in your face. They weren't as polite and pleasant as some of those other British bands were. And of course, Hendrix came along and that changed everything. That was the end of listening to the Beach Boys and you know, all of that kind of music that I kind of listened to at that time. And uh, continued my exploration in the whole uh, acid, psychedelic era, uh, the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, bands like that. Um, and then progressed to Cream, John Mayle. Uh, we spent a lot of time listening to Cream. Getty and I we used to practice uh, all those Cream songs. Uh, and that was really a lot of fun. We painted our guitars. I painted mine to look sort of like uh, Eric Clapton's SG. It didn't look anything like it. But um, it was a lot of fun to do. And Ged painted his bass. And, you know, we, we reckoned we were like them. And then Zeppelin came along. And we really fell in love with Zeppelin. And they were probably the biggest influences on us. Certainly Jimmy Page was the big, biggest influence on me. I loved his playing. And I loved... Um, everything that he represented, his look, his style of playing, the looseness in his playing. I really learned an awful lot from, from him, probably more than anyone else. But at the same time, Peter Townsend was a big influence on me. and um, Yeah, Hendrix, obviously, and uh, Jeff Beck. So, uh, you know, over the years, I think your influences become really quite diverse, even today, I'm influenced by people that I see and hear play. In fact, recently I went to see David Gilmour from, um, as you know, from Pink Floyd on his uh, On an Island tour. And his playing is just so beautiful. It's so full. It's articulate. It's, uh, it's really dynamic. The band sounded great. He's dedicated to quality in every aspect of the presentation of the show and I was moved by that and so uh, maybe I'll, I'll write start writing some songs in, in a slow tempo six um, it, because uh, that's really he does do a lot of that but you know even at this stage in, in my life um, I can still be influenced by other other players and perhaps today uh, with what you learn from me you too will be influenced by another player the writing process with Rush um, and with with me, I guess uh, it's it's been a really interesting experience. Getty and I have been writing together for oh my God, thirty seven or thirty eight years now. Um, we're currently writing for a new record. We've in fact we've at this point we've written about seven songs uh, on our way to about a dozen, I guess. And uh, for us. The joy of writing is just sitting down and playing. And basically, that's what we do. We just pick up our instruments, we jam for a bit, and then uh, hit Pro Tools, or Logic is the software that we use, uh, into record, and then we record everything that we play. That gives us a starting point, And from there, we begin to build a song. So it's quite easy once you get a, a good um, 
inspirational starting point to start coming up with other parts and other sections. And uh, typically for us, we follow that route. And with the software available today, you can very easily move things around, cut and paste, and get a sense of what the arrangement for a song uh, can be and ultimately will be. From there, we will work with lyrics that Niels uh, provided. Um, most often when we start a writing project, Neil will have already written five or six songs lyrically. And as we begin the musical portion of it, we start to marry certain lyrics to certain songs, obviously. Not everything works for everything, and you have to really find the right match. Um, once we've established that match, uh, Getty tends to edit lyrics as he goes along. It's important to him to be able to sing uh, someone else's words as if they were his own. So the um, that whole editing process goes back many stages uh, between Getty and Neil, and they have a wonderful relationship with that. Neil's absolutely open to change, and Ged makes a lot of really great uh, suggestions on where to take a song to make it perhaps less personal, more universal. Uh, and this kind of continues um, right up to when lyrics are done. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great working process for us. It's a very democratic uh, relationship that we have in the band. Nothing really gets done unless we all agree upon it. Uh, and the whole writing process is usually done together. You know, Getty and I will be in one room working, Neil will be in another room. And, uh, and then we'll meet at lunch or we'll meet at some point in the day and discuss uh, different aspects of the arrangement and the songs. And Neil quite often has some very um, useful ideas for arrangement as well. From there, we've got our outline of a song, and then we start adding the recording element. Neil will come in and he'll play to our, our guide tracks, and then we'll start replacing tracks, build up the songs like that. I uh, have searched for years for just the right amp sound and and it's always a difficult thing because your tastes change your playing changes it evolves and you look for different things i know that i've gone through many uh different um stages in my career playing in rush you know we went through a, a time in the mid 80s where we were really exploring keyboards and there's always a bit of a conflict with keyboards and guitar they kind of occupy the same sonic range so um, you know, I went to uh, active pickup uh, guitars in that period. An active pickup is just one that's got a battery powered and it's a single coil and it's a very bright, clean, clear sound. And I thought that that's what I needed at that time to kind of um, cut through some of the dense keyboard stuff that we were doing. Um, I much prefer something like this, which is a more traditional humbucker style. It's a little thicker and a little warmer sounding. Um, amps are always, uh, you know, there's so many great amps, they're coming up with all new designs and a lot of great new designs are based on old designs. Um, you know, it's hard to beat that old Marshall 50 sound and I remember having a great one that I bought, you know, made payments on it, I couldn't afford it back when we were playing bars in the early 70s, but um, sadly I got rid of it when I got some other new stuff and and that's what I've always done I I get new stuff and get rid of it and I never expected to be doing this 30 years later and I wish I had that stuff now I'd be rich, uh, I'd be a very rich man if I did have all those old amps but um, over the years I've been searching for a sound that I'd be happy with and and could live with that had the kind of uh, flexibility and versatility that I was looking for in a sound and I think I've really come up with it with the Hughes and Kettner uh, amp it's a um, this is the Alex Lifeson Signature Edition, which I'm very proud of. I, I've been using the Triamp uh, for a couple of tours and very happy. It's a great sounding amp, really well built, very reliable. Um, it's made in Germany. Um, what I love about this particular amp is that, you know, I've got three uh, stages. Uh, there's a clean sound, a, you know, dirty, tough sound, and then a very... Uh, overdriven sound and in fact I use the th the third stage just really as an effect stage very very overdriven and just bring it in for certain things that I want that kind of character for for me I came up in a single channel amp 
that's the way I learned. So uh, w if you wanted a clean sound, you just turn the guitar down. And uh, I generally play with the guitar on about seven, seven and a half. So if I want to have a, a tough sound, I kind of set the uh, my, my guitar gain at about seven and a half, and then I adjust the amp so I get the kind of thickness and power and character that I want. And then I've got, you know, this space from seven and a half to ten where I solo and I want to get a little more sustain or I want to step it up a little bit uh, and then I can achieve that without having to step on another switch or uh, introduce another sound or, or whatever um, and I think that's been a part of my sound and, and a characteristic of my sound in that it's a bit restrained it's not always you know super distorted and fuzzy and um, and I try to get you know more of that power from my hand uh, and I, I think that's a really good way to learn to play guitar. The great thing about doing the signature series is that we've taken um, a portion uh, of the cost of the amp and donated it to UNICEF and so far we've uh, we've donated over eleven thousand dollars and I know we've got another fund uh, building for a second payment so um, it's nice to be able to put something back in and, and hopefully uh, give children an opportunity, whether it's in music or otherwise, to uh, develop and grow. So I'm really proud of, uh, of that work that we're doing with the people at Houston Kettner. They're terrific people, and I'm very happy to be associated with them. So, uh, you know, I'd highly recommend one to you. <laughs> and you're going to be helping someone, too, if you buy it. This whole idea of the iVideo tunes is really a terrific idea. It's a wonderful way to uh, connect with um, other players who are interested to learn more about how a song is constructed, how a song is built, um, how it's played, particularly when you have the artist show you. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for a lot of people who are amateur players to get to see what goes on. And it's also a great opportunity for artists, m me, I think, to express to you what it's like to play in a band, where I come from, what I've done. Uh, and, uh, and I hope you really have a great time with it and you really enjoy it. I, I know that I have. Tom Sawyer is probably one of our most popular songs. It was uh, on the Moving Pictures record that was done in 1980, I think. <laughs> I don't even remember. Um, it was recorded at the studio in the winter of that year. And um, I do remember that we just had a great time. It's, it's one of the most pleasurable records that we ever made. We worked with Terry Brown, who produced the record. Uh, and it was really, really cold up there, probably minus 30 for most of the winter that we were up there. And, I mean, that's the way it is, and it gets like that. But uh, Tom Sawyer was um, a song that was lyrically co-written with Pai Dubois, a friend of ours who wrote lyrics for another Canadian band called Max Webster. And it's really about that, um, that rebellious spirit. And, uh, and I think the song really comes across as that way. The parts... Um, musically are made up they're they're very uh, powerful and they're very strident and uh, and it really matches the lyrics quite well and that's an important thing in songwriting is to be able to connect lyrics to what you're writing obviously you wouldn't write a happy musical song with dark lyrics so I think the um, the match really works well on this song in, in particular <laughs> So I'd like to show you um, the first verse. Actually, the verses are, are, are basically the same, and they're broken down into an A and B section, the A section being the part that, that has lyrics, and the B section being an instrumental part that bridges into uh, the bridge. The, the, uh, the song is in the key of E, and the first chord is a barred E at the seventh fret. So... I'll just turn it down to a very clean and uninspiring level. 
The second chord is this chord, which I wish I could tell you the name of, but I don't know. And it is. And what we do with this chord is it's right across the seventh fret from the A, D, and G string. So it's E, A, and uh, D. I think I have that right. <laughs> and then we add the index finger on the B string, which is an F, at the fifth fret. I mean, it would be an F if I moved it up like this, but I'm not, so I'm going to change that to an E. <laughs> the interesting thing about doing this sort of thing is you uh, have to slow everything down, and when you play, you don't think about these things. It just comes naturally, and you just go, and it happens. But it's, it's very, very interesting how when you do break it down like this and you have to think about it, it really changes everything. So uh, anyhow, this is the, the first chord. This is the second chord. Then the third chord is... which is an A chord with the added uh, D and G. And then the fourth chord is... remember the second chord, if you just move that down two frets, and that, that's it. And of course, you, you, you pump on that low E string throughout the whole part. So this all works as... And then it's to the C. So we repeat that twice, and it's the C, B, A, C, B, A, and then back to that E chord. And this is the B section of the verse. Then it's to, uh, you know that D chord that we all play when we're playing kind of folky stuff? Well, it's that D chord moved up two frets to the E position. So... Then to the second chord. Now that, all you do with that is move your baby finger down one string to the F sharp and move your index finger from the E down to a C. I didn't know that that was a C, but apparently it is. And then back to that uh, A chord. And there you descend with a G, F sharp, E. So let me just play all those uh, in a sequence. And then back to that C. And then continue down to the G. So. And then we go to the next part. Uh, we've gone from that first verse and we finished on that E. So we, we went from... And here we play that E chord. And what I like to do is I like to add the... Uh, my baby finger at the B on the G string, right there. So that's ringing out all the time, and it just gives the illusion that it's another guitar playing, like a, almost like a double tracking. And I do that quite a bit. I play a lot of chords that have open strings playing, and, uh, and I think it's a very effective way, and, or adding, which I you also use in this song. Uh, you know, in a three-piece, it's really important to have a full sound. And uh, this became uh, just a little, I suppose, a trick to give the sense that there are more than one guitar, pl uh, one, more than one guitar playing. Um, so, we've gone from that C to this E chord, and then we're just ascending with an arpeggio.
So I'm just really climbing up. Dum, 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 dum. but playing the art, rolling arpeggios. And Getty plays those root notes, so it's just reinforcing those root notes and, uh, and the arpeggios give it that roll. And then on top of it, you've got those ringing out. And you keep going until you get sick of it. And then the next move is to that B chord, and that's the first chord of the chorus. And now we've arrived at the chorus. And uh, the chorus is, you know, I just mentioned about these some of these you know, broader chords that I play. Uh, this is one of them. It's the B chord, a barred B chord, but we also add the F sharp below. So it's... And we can open it up like that too. So we've gone from the descending uh, pre-chorus. So we dig into that that E, bam, 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 and then it's the world is A chord, and then we add the G with the A still ringing out. A trick that I learned from Pete Townsend. To the B, back to the e, A. a the A and and then we just hold that chord until Getty's finished doing his thing okay we've gotten through the chorus now and uh, Getty's having fun on the mini Moog and playing his little um, hard out on that thing and I'm just standing there and I've played this E chord the suspended E chord and just letting it ring uh, live on stage I kind of turn my back to or I, I turn around to my amps and try to get a little bit of feedback going and maybe pound the guitar a little bit to uh, create a thumping and a little more sustain uh, and then um, I just follow the sequence that, that Getty's playing and that the two of us play on bass pedals. And that's just to move from the E chord up to an F sharp. And you just go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then I catch up to him on his mini moog part and just play with him. So it's, uh, we've gone from this chord, now it's sustained. And then it's just a, an easy arpeggio. I'll slow it down a little bit for you. It's really hard to play slow, but I'll, I'll try. And you push on the second phrase each time. So, 
I think it's repeated four times. And then I like to just get a little vibrato on that um, B on the E string. And that's the same sort of thing he's doing on the Mini Moog with the, um, the wheel, is getting that uh, Three Stooges kind of sound, <laughs> curly. Uh, and then it's the guitar solo from there. Okay, we've arrived at the solo finally. Um, I love playing solos. They're so much fun to play. It's so free. You play whatever you want. You can play in time if you want to. You don't have to. You don't even have to play in tune. And a lot of times you can create some interesting things by being a little out of tune. This particular solo has a couple of notes that I pull and bend that are. And again, it's a bit of um, a rebellious thing um, to do that. The thing about solos is they're a very personal thing. I, I like to try to play my solos the same throughout the course of a tour. Um, and I think it's important to, to do that because I think um, your listeners want to hear the songs as they were written and recorded. With a solo, sometimes it's a little more difficult because, you know, you're kind of free and you do whatever you want. And, um, and it's a very impulsive thing as well. And that's the way I like to write mine. In fact, most of my solos are written in the first, you know, few takes, maybe five takes tops. And then I start thinking about it too much. And it's, um, and it's, not, good, it's not good for the way I work. I, I'm very spontaneous. And in fact, Getty and I work very close together, uh, closely together on my solos. I play, and then he likes to uh, just compile things, assemble things, try things. Uh, and then I come in and I may play it again, or we'll go with that. And it's a it's a really good um, it's a really good partnership we have in that particular aspect, because it's hard to be objective about this sort of thing. I I could just keep going and going and going and trying too many things, and you need to stop at some point. So I will try to block the solo for you. Um, again, a solo is a very lyrical thing, and it's uh, and, and it's really about pacing, and um, and it's f quite difficult. But I'd like to show you at least some of the parts and how they fit together. And then when you listen to the song, I'm sure you'll be able to follow it once you've figured out where I am, where I am, and and what I'm doing at that point. Once you block it down yourself, then you'll be able to go into the flow and just play the the thing. Um, so it starts down on the first fret on the G string, which would be uh, a G sharp and we slide up to the B. So, uh, and then, So let's just repeat that up to that point. And then it's down to the A on the B on the on the E string at the fifth fret. And then the B string E at the fifth fret. And then it's a pull. And then it's, uh, let's see, C sharp at the second fret. And I like to hit harmonic there. And the way we hit a harmonic is we get very tight on the pick. And and then this, the, the edge of the thumb catches the string after you pluck it. So you can, you can do that everywhere. Practice it. If you, if you can't do it already, practice it. Uh, it's not a particularly difficult thing. It's just a feel thing. And I'm sure it's, it's quite easy to learn. So just to repeat. And 
And then it's up to the seventh fret on the B string. What a nice little melody. And then we slide way up to the the fifteenth um, fret on the B string, so it's a D, so it's so just to review that section. So that is, that's at the, uh, let's see, the 14th fret. You just pull it. And then it's up here on the, um, the G sharp. Just a little. And then it's a flurry of notes. And then back down to that mini moog part. And then we repeat the, um, the uh, intro music or the, the verse music. So let's see if we can put the solo all together. So we start at the... Um So we've gotten through uh, pretty much the meat of the song. Um, there are basically no new parts after this, after the solo. So we've gone back into the... Neil does all his big flurry of drums. Learned everything from me. And then back into the last verse. So mine is not for rent. And then we finish with the And we play this last little bit outro and then it's just the E and F sharp chords that we play at the end. Now on the record I, I go live what I like to do is I like to ring those chords out after the first half of that outro so And this carries on to the end of the song. Uh, live, we go back to the that little mini moog part. 
and just have a big rock and roll ending. So now you've got all the parts, uh, work on them, and then we're going to follow up with playing the song all together as one piece in real time. Hi, I'm Alex Lifeson of Rush, and this is the performance track for Tom Sawyer. Thank you. 